Welcome to the NFCC's Veterans Day Financial Facts Track. Today we're honoring all those who have served and who are serving in the United States military. Thank you for joining us. And if you're catching this after the live video, please be sure to like or comment so that we know that you're here. Um, today I'm joined by Barry Coleman, the Vice President of Education and Counseling Programs at the NFCC, and Lacey Lankford, the military money expert. Both are veterans and both are passionate about helping military personnel with their finances. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. How about you, Barry? Doing wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. I'm enjoying November. You guys, it's yeah. kind of crazy that it's already November, but we're excited that, to, that Veterans Day is coming up. It's Military Family Month. And so I just wanted to start by letting you guys introduce yourselves. Can you talk a little bit about your background in the military and now as advocates and what resources you offer? One from the NFCC and you as the military money expert. And Barry, you go first. Okay, sure. So um, as Courtney mentioned, I, I am a veteran. I'm actually a retired service member. I uh, served uh, a total of 32 years um, in the Air Force and in the Virginia Air National Guard. And I was a first sergeant in the Air National Guard and later served as a uh, command chief master sergeant. So I've had an opportunity to advocate uh, and assist uh, enlisted members. And some of uh, which uh, were facing family and financial challenges. And so I was able to learn of resources that were available um, in the community as well as uh, on base or on post. And in my role as vice president of counseling and education with the uh, NFCC, I help our member agencies by developing and supporting financial education and counseling programs that our members deliver to consumers across the entire United States and in Puerto Rico. So I'm glad that I, I still have uh, an opportunity to um, to serve and, and help um, our military members and their families. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Barry. How about you, Lacey? That's some legit street cred in the military there, Barry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, um, I was also, uh, I was enlisted in the Air Force. I served four years, but I grew up in the military. So my father was a military police officer and, um, while I was serving in the Air Force, that's where I met my husband, who was in the Air Force and then went into the Army. So I have a holistic view of the life cycle of the military. Um, my husband is now retired. Um, and I took that experience with the military and my financial background, and I help the military community make, save, and invest money wisely. And I do that through my website, where I post articles on the Military Money Expert, LaceyLangford.com. And I have a podcast, The Military Money Show, where I have amazing guests come on and we really talk about things that impact the military community in a financial way, whether that be the military spouse, the service member, the transition out of the military, learning how to use a TSP, learning how to budget, maybe entrepreneurship. We really cover a lot on the show. So that's how I kind of help people learn how to do better with their personal finances within the military. Great. That's I would awesome. call that street cred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm such a newbie to the topic, so I'm looking forward to learning from both of you guys. Um, so we're going to get started with a couple questions. Um, the term financial readiness is commonly used in reference to the military, active duty military families. Um, what does that mean for veterans? And it's to you first, Lacey. Um, I think it really means that you're ready to face an opportunity or a challenge with when it comes to money. And a lot of times people get stuck in the challenge area, but there are opportunities that if you aren't financially ready for it, that you're going to miss out on. But on the probably the more majority side of it is that when you're financially ready, you have room to pivot in your life and handle problems. Yeah. So if something comes up, a crisis with family where you're emergency leave and you need to buy a plane ticket to get home, you have the money to cover that. You have the money to put food on your table if um, your spouse can't find a job when you PCS. You have money to um, make sure you're paying your bills on time. And if you're not financially ready, then it's just going to snowball into other problems. So it really is your ability to pivot and to move when it comes to um, life's curveballs. Yeah, okay. How about you, 
That's a really great, and we really focus on that on for all audiences at the NFCC, not just military. So it's great that there are specific resources for this specific population as well. Barry, is there anything oh, yeah. you wanted to add? Sure. You know, I, I really applaud the um, the military for adopting that term of uh, financial readiness. You know, for me, it, it means being prepared uh, financially so that you can effectively carry out your military duties without having to worry about your family's finances. And it allows you to, to focus on the mission that you were trained uh, to do, um, knowing that your finances are in order, that, that you're prepared um, you know, for the financial challenges that, that might occur. And then you can focus on your military duties. And, and so it, it really plays into the, the whole um, idea of readiness for, for the military. You have to be, be ready on the, the home front uh, before you can be, be ready on the battlefield. Right. And just to piggyback off what you're saying is that within the military community, your personal finances is important for your security clearance, which is necessity for your job to keep it. And if your sure. personal finances aren't doing well and then a problem comes up, that could have a negative impact on your security clearance and your ability to do your job and maybe po possibly have it suspended or revoked. So it, within the military community, being financially ready is crucial. Yes, absolutely. Right. And would that also impact their ability to maintain their military like rank and things like that as well? It could lead lead to disciplinary action if, if um, the military members not handling their personal affairs uh, properly. It, it could cause um, you know problems and, and disciplinary actions um, for that, that military member. Yeah, because if you have it completely revoked, which, you know, they give you the opportunity to fix the problem. It's not like they just come mm -hmm. in and, you know, take it away from you and you don't have know what's going on. But if you do ultimately have it revoked and your job requires you to have a security clearance, then you can no longer do that job. And you ha are faced with the fact that you have to find a job within the military that doesn't require a security clearance <clears throat> and hope that you're able to transition into that. And if that's not a possibility, then you could ultimately be put out of the military. Mm -hmm. Wow. I wasn't aware. I mean, yeah. I knew it was a big deal, but that's huge. It's not a fun fact. It's not a fun no. fact. But it's <laughs> right. So among the challenges that veterans face, one of the first is the transition from active duty military to civilian life. So what are some of the resources available? Also, how did that go for each of you personally? Mm -hmm. um, and what do you think would make the transition easier? And we'll start with Barry. Sure, sure. So, you know, certainly the, the transition from military life to civilian life can be very challenging. It, it, it was for me uh, as a military member, um, you know, in, in the military, you know, a lot of things are provided for you and, and I think made easier for you. And so, you know, I, I joined the military at a, at a young age. And so, you know, right after high school. And so the military was was the only life uh, that I knew. And so when I got out, it was sort of a, a culture shock. And I realized that there weren't things that were um, taken care of for me and, and, a, and a structure that was there uh, for me. And so I had to learn a lot of things, you know, after I got out. And I think, you know, really the, the key, though, is, is planning uh, early. Um, you know, if, if veterans and service members uh, you know, I would recommend start planning. If you know that you're you're about to retire or or separate from the military, start planning at at least a year in advance um, of the separation or the retirement. And um, the military does do a great job nowadays um, in providing transition services uh, for their members. So that that's a logical place to start um, with those offices within in the military. I would also highly recommend that military members start saving as much as they can while they're in, and this will help to ease the transition. Um, so that's another important tip um, uh, that I have. It, it would allow them to, you know, make ends meet uh, before they start receiving uh, their retirement pay if they're retired, or uh, before they find uh, another career if they're going out into the, the civilian sector uh, to work. 
I am so glad you asked this question because I think more people need to discuss this and be very open about what it was like for them getting out. And I'm just like, Barry, like there, it, it could have gone a lot better. Could have gone a lot better for me. <laughs> really, I waited to the last minute. I was on the fence whether I was going to stay in or get out. I really, I had an amazing experience serving and I wanted to stay, but I had other things I wanted to do in life. And another four years would have made that difficult for me. So ultimately, I, I think I waited. I had less than a month and I, I had to s sell back my leave. That's how short notice it was. I, I couldn't even take the leave. And um, I really oh, wish yeah. that I would have prepared more for it and, and used the resources available to me because you don't know what you don't know. And yeah. people getting out, you could be on the spectrum of you're a young service member. You haven't been in very long. So there is a lot you still don't know. Or you could be on the other end where you have served 20 years and your identity is in the military. And that transition getting out is very difficult. Mm -hmm. And the whole family is impacted by the transition out of the military. So that's something that people also aren't discussing is that how can we better prepare the spouses and the children that have grown up in the military that they're also facing this challenge of, of changing their identity, changing their careers, mm -hmm. changing where they're living. So I'm going to say, Barry, I think people should prepare <clears throat> two years out yeah, yeah. and really start. It, it may not be a full immersion into the transition process, but they're looking at what are the possibilities? What do I want to be when I grow up? Mm -hmm. It may be mm -hmm. a certification that for me to do the job that I'm doing in the military, in the civilian world, I will have to have. So that's something you can start preparing for and doing to have it the day you get out. So you're able to still earn the level of income that you have in the military. Um, also, you can experiment with getting mentorship and learning different career paths in that two year process. So you can understand what the possibilities are. And one resource that's amazing for that is Veterati. Mm. You can sign up for that and get a mentor in, in different areas. If you're looking into entrepreneurship, if you're looking into banking, if you're looking into something with aircrafts, you can find somebody within there that you could talk with for an hour to say, hey, what's the playing field like in your career path? And start to understand that, what kind of income you would be making, what a day in the life of their job is, what certifications, what training you need. Um, and I completely agree with Barry, you have to start saving your money well in advance of making the transition out because things are going to be different. You will be paying a lot more taxes that year you deploy and you don't pay federal income tax. You're going to be paying more federal income tax because um, when you're in the military, your BAH and your BAS aren't taxable income. Right. So that's an impact that a lot of people aren't aware of is that that's going to eat into the money that you bring home every month. So yeah. I think there's a lot of things on the, on the plate to think about. Yeah. I'd also add, um, I guess one of the, the, the big challenges is, you know, the whole paying for health care, you know, in, in the military, you know, your health care is, is taken care of dental, you know, medical. When you get into the civilian world, you, you, you realize that um, even if you have a job, the uh, health care benefits aren't as aren't nearly as gen generous as they are in the military. And so there's quite a bit you'll have to pay uh, out of pocket. So I think that further erodes uh, your your income and your earnings when you've got to pay that big chunk for, for medical and dental care. Definitely. Th that's why, too, the TAPS classes are so important for people to actually attend them and not discount them. Unfortunately, somebody may go into a class and they are a great writer and they know how to write their resume. And then they go back to their office and say, oh, that resume class was worthless. Well, not mm -hmm. to the person that's never even seen a resume before. That yeah. would have been very valuable for them to attend that to get the basic knowledge they need to, to, to complete a resume. So I think, you know, give everything a shot. Go check it out. Like, hey, if it didn't work for you, that's great. But if you took something away from those classes that could help the transition be better for you and your family, then it's well worth it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Take advantage of every opportunity you have to learn while you're there. For free. For free. Let's, yeah, let's remember that. Sure. <laughs> exactly. Um, so this year, the NFCC and Wells Fargo released a military financial readiness survey that was specific specifically for active duty and military spouses. And it showed and indicated that half of active duty and their spouses have turned to the gig economy for additional income. 
Um, first, why do you think this is necessary for them? Do you feel like the income isn't substantial enough in the military? And second, do you think this is the same for veterans or if it's just that they're not using or planning ahead? Um, what are your thoughts, Lacey? I, I, I'm not surprised by that at all. <clears throat> I think within the military spouse community, it's the gig economy is more flexible. So if your spouse is going to deploy and you're a single parent, it's, it's hard to work a nine to five when you, if your child gets sick or you, you know, you want to be there for their um, terrific kids ceremony, mm. having a gig economy job makes it easier for you to be able to be present when your spouse is deployed, but also bring in that money because you do want to have quality of life. You don't want to be living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I do think that part of that comes into debt. A lot of it's not unique to the military. Everybody has a lot of debt mm -hmm. and um, having, you know, a side hustle of some sort to bring in extra money to pay down debt, I think is another reason why they're doing it. But it's also something that is PCS proof. They can, if they're driving for Uber, you can do that at Fort Benning. You can do that at Fort Drum. It, you can take that with you. If you're, you know, running errands for people, you can do that, you know, on any coast, any place in the United States. So I think the flexibility and the making it so they can have that job as soon as they arrive to their spouse's next duty station, I think are reasons why. And for the service members and for veterans, I think service members start to dabble to start to understand what life is gonna be like outside mm -hmm. of the military, which I think is a really good idea to start mm -hmm. to get used to one, working with civilians, which is another cultural shock for the military community, um, to kind of see how things work and to have that extra money. But then as veterans, I think the lack of preparation when they transition out, the lack of savings and um, understanding how the finances will be different, from when they were active duty to when they are a civilian impacts them. And that's why a lot of them do have to have um, a side hustle of some sort. Okay. Yeah, I, I totally agree um, there, Lacey. And I, I love what you said that, you know, the gig economy allows service member and their families to be PCS proof. I think that's absolutely the case because um, there are so many systems in place now that um, help to facilitate gig economy jobs. And you mentioned, you know, Uber and Lyft, those are certainly uh, some of them there and there are others uh, as well. You know, it, and, you know, I also think that um, being in the gig economy is um, favorable to military because, you know, everyone can use extra income. You know, I always say you can never have a, enough money, right? And having having that that flexibility to be able to earn additional income really comes in handy to, to, you know, help retire debt, you know, quicker, uh, and also save for any financial goals, uh, that, that you might have. So, um, you know, it's not surprising that it's, that it's popular in, in the military, just as it is in the civilian world today. I'd like to add one more thing is that I think too, this goes a little bit deeper, but there's this big transition from before for military spouses, the way to have like side hustle money was to be in multi-level marketing, you know, to, mm -hmm. to sell Avon, to sell Tupperware, to sell Rodan and Fields. And that was kind of a, a thing that they could do that was PCS proof. Mm -hmm. But now with the internet and all these apps, your smartphones, it's opened this whole other world to military spouses, which I think is amazing and freeing for them. And I think that's why we're seeing this move is that that was something that wasn't their own, that maybe didn't have as much control. There was more investment that they had to put into doing those type of jobs. And mm -hmm. now they can just jump in their car. They don't have to have a large investment of their household money to have this side hustle. So I think it's it's really a shift in the possibilities that are out there for extra income for military spouses. Yeah, great right. point. And it's easier for different personality types to hop into uh, Ubering or picking up groceries for people rather than doing multi-level marketing where you have to like oh, reach yeah. out and do tons and tons of outreach. Or um, dog walking. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's great. There's so many options now for them. Yes, yeah. it's it's exciting. It really is. Yeah. Um, so 
A lot of the research shows that military service members are generally more savvier with their money compared to the general population, but many are still struggling with paying off their debt and reaching their goals. Um, what tips do you have for anyone struggling with debt, both while in active duty and after they transitioned? Yeah. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say first and foremost, um, try to eliminate any unnecessary spending. I think, you know, anything other than the essentials, food, shelter, transportation should be carefully uh, evaluated and, and reduced or even uh, eliminated. When, when the goal is to pay off um, debt, there's not a lot of uh, flexibility, I think, um, in, in a budget. You want to get rid of that debt as, as quickly as possible. So if you're spending money on things that aren't essentials, I think that just makes it more difficult and takes longer to, to, to pay uh, the debt back. I would say uh, the other thing is to uh, develop a plan, a solid plan to help to address the debt. Um, and certainly, you know, in the, in the industry that, that I work in, nonprofit uh, credit counseling, they can certainly help uh, individuals to, to develop that type of, of plan. And then while you're, uh, of course, working to, to pay off your debt, you don't want to take on any, any new debts and, um, you know, stick to your plan. Uh, it, it's achievable. You know, people do it. Um, you know, we, we have so many success stories in our industry of people that have paid off a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars in unsecured debt just by sticking to, to the plan. So it, it works. Yeah. yeah. You got to get as low as you can go. You got to get as low as you can go. That's you really do. You have to drop as many expenses as you possibly can and really focus on if you can, there's only two ways you got to bring in more money or you got to spend less money. Yeah. And so if it, it's awesome, if you could do both, you could spend less mm -hmm. money plus bring in more money, but if you can't bring in any more money, then you have to really take a, a hard look at how you're um, spending your money. And I think going into paying off debt, you really have to look at your self-truths, what you know to be true about yourself and your strengths and your weaknesses. Because mm -hmm. in, in, in two, if you're married, this is definitely an exercise that's needed to be done before you create your game plan, but understand what you're willing to give up. Because for each person, that's going to be different. Like I have no problem giving up going out to eat. I prefer to eat at home. I like to cook like that to me is like foreign. Like what? Like that's hard for you not to go out to eat. I, I don't want to get in a car. I don't want to get dressed. I don't want to put makeup on. I don't want to go out to eat. So that's, but for other people, it's like, they don't enjoy cooking. They don't, they want to go out. That's something that's really important to them. Versus I like to, I don't know, online shop. Like if I want to be able to buy clothes. So there's things that you're willing to give and take. So figure out what that is that you're willing to sacrifice um, and really go after it. Be like, okay, I can totally give up going out to eat. I can totally give up having Netflix. That's not something I'm really into anyway. So find out what works for you. And, and it makes it easier to cut those expenses versus if you know that you love Starbucks every day, don't give up your coffee. You're going to be like miserable and you're not going to stick with it. It's that's something that's very important to you. No judgment there. That's your thing. So sure. really um, understand what's important to you and then, and start cutting costs. And, and remember it is not forever. It's just for right now. So when people start thinking about paying off debt, they get overwhelmed with the amount and, Oh, we'll never get done. I'm going to have to give up my Starbucks forever. No, just going to have to give it up for a little while to you write your ship and, and get yourself out of debt, get everything under control. Then you can improve your quality of life. Yeah. Those are really awesome <laughs> practical tips. What if somebody feels like they can't do that on their own, where would you act like recommend them going for help like on base or out or where mm -hmm. would you say? Yeah. Uh, well, within the military community, you can go on installation. Most installations have a personal financial counselor that's mm -hmm. at the any of the uh, financial readiness offices that can help you do a budget. They can talk to you about money. If they're not a good fit, and let's remember this, that a lot of times when you go talk to somebody, whether it be a doctor, um, you know, your veterinarian, a financial person, sometimes you guys just don't drive. They're, you don't like them. It's not going to work out. You don't give up there. You go and find another person to help you. So just know that that's normal if you don't 
want to divulge your whole private life to this person. If you're not comfortable with them, then you need to move on and find somebody else. Mm -hmm. And the military has a great system for that. So if you're not comfortable with the personal financial counselors at those installation offices, then a lot of times they have um, PFCs embedded in units. So you could try there. If that doesn't work, then you can go to Military One Source, and mm -hmm. they have financial counselors mm -hmm. that can come meet you in your local area. They can also have somebody help you online. Um, you could also ask a friend, like, hey, I need a kick in the pants once a week to make sure that I didn't go out to eat. You yeah. know, so there's you have to, again, go back to your self truths. What will work well for you? Going and talking to a professional for them to teach you how to do a budget, how to manage everything, and then maybe finding somebody that you – you know, it's like a sibling to you that if they yell at you, that you're still going to forgive them and know that they have your best interest at heart. That's like, you know, when you go for a long run with somebody and they're like, just run faster. And then you're like angry at them. Like, no, I don't want right. to. But <laughs> at the end of the run, you thank them for it. You're like, thank you for pushing me a little bit harder. It's the mm -hmm. same same way with money. So just look online if, if you're if you're not happy with the people that you meet in person. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned having having an accountability partner. I think that is uh certainly a, a, an effective uh, technique and and typically you know married couples they they are each other's accountability partner but you know if you're if you're a single person find someone that, that you know um handles their finances well and and will hold you accountable and ask them to, to help you i think they would would love to to, to do that if they're if they're a good friend so i love the, the the idea of having that accountability uh partner to help you through this and, yeah. and you can set rules for yourself to help when there is like peer pressure or things like that. If you know you're trying to get out of debt or you're trying to get help with your money, you know, know that, okay, hey, today I'm going to go again to talk with that financial counselor. I'm going to go once a week until I get out of debt, or I'm going to go once a month to check back with them to show them that I've gotten out of debt. Set a rule for yourself. So that way, you know, if you're starting to slack off, like, okay, well, the month of November went by and I didn't go talk with that financial counselor. I need to do that. You're kind of pushing yourself or, hey, when I go to Target, I'm only, I can only shop at Target if I have a list, you know, so setting some rules and, and got kind of, um, what are the, when you go bowling, the bumper lanes that they put out, <laughs> what are those bumper lanes out for yourself right. um, to make it easier to stay on track? Yeah. And I think it's also important like to share your goals, like with the people around you or like the people that you go out the most with, maybe just letting them know, Hey, I'm trying not to only eat out maybe once, a, once a month instead of once a week or things like that. And then I think people in general want to encourage each other to meet their goals mm -hmm. um, Yeah, by doing that. It just, you may even influence someone else to make better financial choices. It could be like a domino effect. Sure. Yeah. And it can be fun and, you know, challenging and, you know, competitive and there, you can find the good in a bad situation. If you really try, you know, to find the right. kind of the thing that's going to help you get through the little crutch, the little ray of light, a little bit of joy. You, you just have to really try. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and focus on the end game, you know, where, where you want to be, you know, a year from now, two years from now, five years from now. And you have to constantly remind yourself, I'm doing this this for a reason. And um, I think it, it helps make the journey, I think, more palatable. Yeah, I really liked what you said, Lacey, about how it's not forever. It's just for right now. Yes. Like, That's uh, something I've learned coaching is... I could see it in people's faces when I say, okay, we've, we've got, we've got a challenge here. You know, you've got like 40 grand in debt or sometimes I've had people with 300 grand in debt. And when we start talking about a game plan, you can just see them glaze over and start to shut down. And it's like, Hey, look, this isn't the rest of your life. We're just right. going to have to push through and in the military. You can talk with people and put it in perspective. Like, okay, this is like basic training. Like you knew it was going to suck. You knew it was going to be horrible, but you got your mind right and you made it through. This is going to be like your little basic training, like three months of not fun, but it's not forever. And then at the end of it, it's going to feel really, really awesome. And it's going to be an amazing accomplishment that you're going to be very proud about. So keeping things in perspective, I think, is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you guys have any final tips or resources that you'd like to share with anyone who's watching? Is this me? Do I go first? Sure, okay. Sorry. Um, no, um, my final tip would be to be kind to yourself and not judge yourself. There's 
always a place people will be mean. You shouldn't be talking bad to yourself. Get your mind right before you go into changing your financial life and, and don't compare yourself to other people. They're not going to help you pay your bills. So you don't need to worry about what they think. You just need to do what you need to do and, and be kind to yourself and remember that it's, um, it's not forever. It's for right now. And make sure that you use resources and get the help that you need. It's out there, especially in the military community. It's free. Um, even if you've gotten out within, I think, 120 days, you can still use Military One Source as a resource, even if you're not retired. If you're retired, you're still able to use that. So make sure that you get the help. It's out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, there are so many resources now. I think more resources than than there have ever been. Certainly more than you know, were available when when I was in the military. And these resources can be in the form of apps. They can be online resources. They can be on on based on post resources as well as various resources in the community. So there's there's help um, for you, you know, out there to uh, to have a better financial life. So take advantage of those and. And I agree with uh, with Lacey, be kind to yourself. That's that's really important. Yeah, well, thank you both for joining us today. Um, I really enjoyed this chat and learned a lot. And I hope it's really helpful for all the people watching to make better financial d decisions. Um, and thank you both for your service and the dedication and to all the people out there who are serving. Thank you and we honor you today. Thank and we'll be back again next week with more fun topics. Great, thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.